Aerobic respiration is the preferred catabolic metabolism for just about everything besides obligate anaerobes, as long as oxygen is available. Um, the redox reactions that uh, are carried out when oxygen is around simply yield more energy and therefore more ATP can be produced. But there are times, places, habitats in which oxygen is limited, and under those conditions, anaerobes have the advantage. And there are two options, anaerobic respiration and fermentation. So we're going to look at what happens uh, under anaerobic conditions. But first, let's look at some anaerobic conditions. Anaerobic infections are caused by anaerobic bacteria. They tend to colonize deep wounds. Think of uh, someone stepping on a nail and introducing microbes uh, from the nail deep into their tissue, maybe even to the bone. Um, think of a stab wound. Think of a bullet wound. Uh, think of a, a surgical wound. Surgical wounds are often deep wounds as well. Um, they can colonize deep tissues um, when there's a parenteral route of introduction, and some internal organs can be infected by anaerobes as well. Some common anaerobic infections would include tetanus, appendicitis, gingivitis in the mouth, skin ulcers in diabetics like this skin ulcer that you see uh, here on this patient in the picture, or gangrene, which is the infection of dead necrotic tissue. A couple examples of some anaerobes, and there are several others, but these are two of the more common ones, so I thought I'd introduce these two, are Bacteroides fragilis and Peptostreptococcus species. Bacteroides fragilis is a gram-negative bacillus. You can see it in the upper right corner there. They are normally living in our intestines under normal healthy conditions. As long as they stay in our intestines, they're fine. It's when they get out of the intestines that they cause problems. They can cause abdominal infections if they leave the intestinal tract and get into the abdomen from um, uh, an operation, for example, or from a ruptured appendix, or from one of those other, um, like a, a, a parenteral trauma, a stab wound, an impalement, uh, a bullet wound, any of those can introduce Bacteroides fragilis into the abdominal cavity where there's very little oxygen available. In females, it can cause pelvic abscesses, and in virtually anyone, it can cause bacteremia, which means an infection of, of the bloodstream with bacteria. Now, at first blush, that might sound weird because the blood carries oxygen around, but um, our venous blood has little to no oxygen, and our, our arterial blood has very little free dissolved oxygen. The majority of it is bound to hemoglobin on the red blood cells. And so believe it or not, the blood for the most part is actually a relatively anaerobic habitat from a microbial standpoint. Now, Peptostreptococcus species, these are generally referred to as GPAC, gram-positive anaerobic cocci. So clinically, you'll hear that term GPAC or GPAC. Think, okay, Peptostreptococcus. These guys are also part of our normal bacteria, but they live in our mucous membranes. Now, if they get away from those mucous membranes, especially far from, from the surface and far from uh, any uh, blood vasculature, they have the potential to cause infections. Deep organ abscesses, uh, obstetric and gynecological sepsis, and intraoral infections. So two examples of common anaerobes that can cause some pretty nasty infections. Interestingly, both of them are part of our normal flora, part of the bacteria that normally colonize us. We, there's a term for that, by the way, we call them opportunistic pathogens. Because when things are going well for both of us, they don't infect us. They get in the wrong place or get an advantage or we get weak for some reason, all of a sudden we've got a pathogen on our hands. Now how do anaerobes make a living if oxygen isn't available to them? Well, there's two options. On the left you see we, we see uh, the picture of respiration. We already talked about that with aerobic respiration. Prokaryotes, bacteria and their close cousins archaea, many of them can respire anaerobically. They can still carry out processes like glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, and have an external electron acceptor come in and carry those electrons away. It's just not oxygen. I'll show you some examples of some alternative terminal electron acceptors that can support cell respiration. Um, this is in nature quite common, among pathogens less so. Among pathogens, we see much more commonly as an, an anaerobic alternative to aerobic cell respiration, we see fermentation. And we're going to see that fermentation is a very truncated process. It's very short. It yields very little ATP overall, but it's extremely common very um, uh, and therefore very important. 
All right, so let's, let's think about those anaerobic respiratory bacteria. Anaerobic respiratory bacteria can carry out full cell respiration using something other than oxygen as their terminal electron acceptor. In nature, this list here represents the most common alternative terminal electron acceptors. Nitrate or nitrite can get reduced, meaning take on electrons, into a variety of gaseous forms of nitrogen, NO, N2O, N2. Manganese 4 and iron 3 can get reduced to manganese 2 or iron 2 in nature. These are particularly odd because they're not soluble. Under neutral conditions, standard typical conditions, manganese oxides and iron oxides are solid precipitates. So bacteria are actually respiring on, they're breathing, if you will, solid chunks of manganese and iron. Iron oxides look like rust, they're orange. Manganese oxides tend to be a bit more black or grayish. And these are what give soils their, their orange, reddish, yellowish, brownish colors that they have. It's manganese and iron oxides. <clears throat> when oxygen gets depleted in those soils, say from a flooding rain, all of a sudden anaerobes can start reducing those and dumping their electrons from electron transport into those. Sulfate, SO42- gets reduced to hydrogen sulfide. That is the stinky, sulfury, rotten egg smell that you get around some, uh, some hot springs or that you can smell at the end of Interstate 8 uh, when the tide is low and, um, and all, those, all those anaerobic sediments have been exposed. The ocean is loaded with sulfate. So when oxygen is gone, sulfate becomes the, the next best choice for microbes in the ocean. It's essentially a limitless supply. Now, there are some archaea, not bacteria that we know of, but some archaea that can actually use CO2 as their electron acceptor. That's a really bizarre thing because we think of CO2 as the oxidized product of this whole process. It can actually be used to collect electrons. It's a crummy electron acceptor. Very little energy has gotten from this reaction, but there are microbes who have made a living at this and we call them methanogens because methanogens produce methane. They generate methane, CH4. That's natural gas. Now, among all these options, um, the nitrate reduction process, NO3 minus, NO2 minus, is really the only one we see among pathogens. We don't see pathogenic microbes reducing manganese, iron, sulfate, CO2. Um, nitrate, nitrite, for example, E. coli uh, is a nitrate reducer under anaerobic conditions. Um, among uh, pathogens, among bacteria that are important for human health, um, nitrate, nitrite is probably the only important alternative terminal electron acceptor. So we looked at aerobic cell respiration, a review of this at the end of the last uh, video. This is the exact same slide, but I've adjusted it for anaerobic respiration. The only change I made was in the top left corner, I called it anaerobic cell respiration. And in the bottom right corner, instead of oxygen getting converted to water, I said some oxidized terminal electron acceptor, TEA, this is in blue in the bottom right, becomes a reduced form of that terminal electron acceptor. And now less than 34 ATPs per round of the electron transport chain per glucose molecule is going to be produced. Okay, and it really depends on how strong of an oxidant it is. Nitrate's a very good oxidant, and so we can get pretty high ATP yield. CO2 is a crummy oxidant. We get much lower ATP yield for that. So I'd like you to take the time to go through this anaerobic cell respiration review and think through it all, play the video several times if you need to, make sure you understand how anaerobic respiration compares to aerobic respiration.